When I first, <clears throat> well, when I first started at Smith Chapel, I did not need reading glasses. <clears throat> now I can't even see my notes until I put them on, which is sad. Hopefully I have them here somewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to read this morning from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 to 40. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Be pleased if you have your Bibles. You, I would encourage you to follow along whatever version you have. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 through 40. Very familiar portion of scripture. <clears throat> Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried to, in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And then David said to Saul, I, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David, David put them off. And then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. Shall we pray? Lord, even though we've heard this story many, many times in many ways, we ask, Lord, that you would refresh our hearts with this story anew that we may not only hear it in maybe a little different way, but more importantly, that these words might be ingrained on our hearts and that we might be able to walk forth more encouraged to be the people of God. And we'll thank you and praise you in the blessed and holy name of Christ and the church said, amen. <clears throat> I'm glad you're still the church. All right. Well, like I said, you've heard this story many, many times. <clears throat> David and Goliath. Goliath was huge. And his Philistine army was on one side of the valley, and, and the, the Hebrews were on the other side of the valley, the Israelites. And they were faced off for days. And every morning, Goliath, and if you read, the, read another portion of the scripture of the story, it describes how big Goliath was. And I didn't take the time to reread that, to, but I remember he was like nine feet tall. And I think the tip of his spear, just the tip of his spear, was a hunk of metal that weighed like 15 to 25 pounds. Just, just the tip of his spear. The man was mammoth. And so he would come down every morning into the valley and he'd taunt the Israelites and say, send somebody out here to fight me. Of course, everybody was scared to death because in those days, Jewish people still aren't very, very large to, for the most part, but in those days, they, they figure that they were average height. The average man in those days for the Israelites was about five foot five. So even though King Saul was head and shoulders above every other Israelite, he wasn't about to go fight that guy. And nobody else was either. So David shows up. David was out in the fields. He was a shepherd boy. He shows up bringing food for his brothers because that's the way the armies worked in those days, that the families would feed their sons who were fighting. So David brought in supplies. He's looking around and he sees everybody on a standoff and he hears this big guy down in the valley taunting his brothers and, and, his, and, his, and his relatives. He's thinking, what, what is this? Is anybody going to stand up to this guy? And his brother says, go back to the field. He said, no. I'm kind of paraphrasing here a little bit. He said, no, we, we've got to take care of this guy. And Saul tries to talk him out of it. Finally, Saul says, okay, okay, you, you can't go out there by yourself, you know, with no protection. Take my armor. So he takes off his suit of mail puts it on David, he takes off his helmet, puts it on David, hands him a spear. David's got this stuff that he's never had on before. And it, it, it'd be kind of like trying to run a track meet <clears throat> with a suit of armor on. David said, I, I've never done this kind of stuff before. I've, I've never worn this stuff. I can't, I can't fight like this. So he takes it all off. 
And he takes his shepherd's staff and he walks down to the brook, which is running in the valley. And the Bible says, as we read this morning, he picked up five smooth stones, puts them in his pouch, and yells for, for Goliath to come now. Now, there's a lot of speculation about this story. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us why David picked up five stones. There was only one giant that he had to slay. Picks up five stones. Well, even though the Bible doesn't tell us that, certainly a lot of people have speculated. One of the speculations is that uh, through scripture and, and some other sources, a lot of scholars believe that Saul, excuse me, that Goliath had four brothers. And they were big too. And so they might have been, the Bible doesn't say this, but they were probably there that day. And David probably saw them. So just in case he decided he might have to fight these other brothers, he put four extra stones in his pouch. That's one theory. Again, we don't know, it's just a theory. I have another theory. Actually, there's a couple other ones. It might have been a habit. We do a lot of things from habit. I, uh, I drove in here this morning. My, my inclination was to drive up by Lambert Hall and park right close to Lambert Hall. Why? Because the pastor always parked up there. <laughs> That's a habit. Well, I refrained from that habit that day. But David might have had a habit of putting five stones in his pouch for whatever reason. We don't know that either. I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion he probably put five stones in there just in case he missed the first time. It just stands to reason. We don't know. Just speculation. But he gets those five little stones. Now, now picture this. He's, he's going up against this magnificent specimen of humanity. Most of us, I think the tallest guy I've ever been in the presence of, if, if that's a, it's probably bad English, but I think was seven foot seven. Seven foot seven. Now that is tall. Even Andy's not that tall. Seven foot seven. That's, I mean, you, wow. I'm five foot seven. And that's two feet taller than me. Well, this guy was like nine feet tall. And David, instead of going to battle with all this armor that would have protected him, hopefully somehow, takes it all off and goes for these wee little stones. Why in the world? You know, <clears throat> for some reason, we tend to believe, especially in this country. Anybody here from Texas? Oh, <laughs> so you especially. Uh, we tend to believe that bigger is better. Yes, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> bigger is better. So we want bigger cars. We want bigger homes. And yes, we want bigger congregations. How many times have you prayed for this place to be filled up? I had the fortune over, over the years that I was here to see it's filled up several times. It's kind of cool. We, so we, we pray for that. We ask God for that. We ask him to send people. We go out and we invite people. We do all sorts of things to get bigger congregations. When I came to Smith Chapel 23, or I forget how many years ago it was now. When I came here, I was talking to a pastor <clears throat> from down in uh, the Arlington area and and uh, he said, wow, he said, uh, pretty small church. I think there were six, six elderly ladies there at that time. And one elderly guy who's the hall is named after now. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, well, how long do you figure you'll stay? I said, hey, I, I might retire there. And that was always my attitude. I, I pastored six small churches in my lifetime, four of them at one time up in Western Pennsylvania. Six of them. And my, my mentality going into each one was, I might retire there. I wasn't looking for, uh, for some five-year plan so I could get out. But I, I have to say, a lot of pastors do that. They say, well, this is kind of a stepping stone to something big. I never had that attitude because I believe that size, when it comes to congregations, doesn't matter. But anyway, he looked at me when I said, I might retire there. He just, he laughed. He laughed out loud. 
And he said to me, I will never forget the words he said to me. He said, they don't have critical mass. They don't have critical mass. They're not big enough. You can't retire there. That's, that's, a, that's a pipe dream. Well, actually, I did retire from here. Because I wasn't worried about the size of the congregation. And this congregation in, in my time here fluctuated from six up to 41, down to four, up to 20. You know, it, it was always all over the map. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple minutes. When David faced off with Goliath, I want you to know he was not worried about critical mass. He wasn't. Can I get an amen on that? All you have to do is read the story. He was not worried about critical mass. In Zechariah 4.10, there's a great line. I love this portion of scripture. I'm reading this from the King James Version. It says, for, for who has despised the day of small beginnings? Who has despised the day of small beginnings? That's a reference to Zerubbabel, if you remember him. Zerubbabel was, uh, was in charge of rebuilding the, the temple and, and uh, the surrounding areas of Jerusalem, which had been destroyed. And he laid that first cornerstone. And Zechariah writes, as the Lord directed, for who has despised the day of small things? Well, sometimes we do. Sometimes we'll do something and, and it'll seem so insignificant and small and we'll kind of hate it. Ah, that really wasn't much. That really wasn't really what I was hoping for. But God says, don't, don't despise the day of small beginnings. When the disciples were hungry, Jesus was preaching. They came to him and said, we need to send everybody home. There's like 5,000 guys here, plus their families. We need to send everybody home for lunch. Jesus said, well, why? <laughs> well, Jesus, we looked around. All we got are these few fish and a couple loaves of bread, and that's not going to fly. I want you to know something. You probably heard that story. Jesus was not worried about critical mass. When I preach, you got to say amen or I, I quit right in the middle. In Mark 8, 7, it says, and they had few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Whoa, started to get critical mass. And that's every, after everybody has eaten. Jesus did not worry about critical mass. He was concerned about doing God's will. David was concerned about doing God's will. Thank you. Most of us are not old enough to remember World War II. In fact, I'm not even old enough to remember World War II. Oh, you are? Okay. You're my guy. In World War II, we fought... <clears throat> Of course, we fought a whole group of people, but the main guy was a guy by the name of Hitler. An interesting thing about Hitler, he had a fascination with huge weapons. If you do any history on this, huge weapons. He had this one can, I guess you could call it a cannon. It was so big, I forget how many uh, millimeters uh, of, how do, how do they uh, measure bullets, not millimeters? In what? It's millimeters? Okay. But well, it was like 90 or it was huge. I don't remember what it was exactly. These things, these bullets or cannon fought, whatever you call it, this ammunition was so huge, they, they would drop it, uh, you know, on the enemy lines and it would just wipe out masses of people. But the thing about that cannon was they used to have to drag it. And it would take a whole battalion to drag this thing. And it would take a bunch of guys to load it up. And, and by the time they got it fired, you know, the enemy knew they were coming. And it just wasn't. And plus, if they shot several rounds in a row, it would just kind of melt down. They couldn't, they couldn't use it for another several hours. But it was big. Hitler loved big. And you can look at all sorts of things that he did were, that were like that. Tanks. He wanted to be able to build bigger and bigger tanks. You know what America did during that time? They were concerned with quality. 
and they built little tanks and lots of them and were able to win all these battles because they were looking for quality. They were looking for something that could defeat the enemy, not something that was, they could brag about. If you ever look at the early church, you know, we, we read, you know, my wife and I are right now are, are doing our devotions every morning in, in Romans. And Romans, like everything else that Paul wrote, was to a church in some city, Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi, Rome. And we, we get the idea somehow, and I remember when I first became a Christian, this was my idea. I just figured this is the way it is. I I just figured when he wrote to the church in Rome, he was writing to, to a bunch of people in this big cathedral. First century. Cathedral? <laughs> no cathedrals. In fact, there were no Smith chapels. What? Who, who in the world was he writing to? He was writing, he was writing to little groups of people that met in people's homes. Oh no, that, that can't be right. It is right. That's exactly what he, who he wrote to. In fact, sometimes he would name them. Uh, this, is to, this is to the church that meets in Chloe's, li Chloe's living room. What kind of a church is that? Small, tiny, little, but yet that church turned the world upside down through the power of Jesus Christ. He wrote to small groups in house churches. Early Christians gathered in those small private homes that we now call house churches. And there would be several of them across the city. And Paul would write to all those Christians in that city. And the Greek noun for church in the Bible is ecclesia, which literally means assembly. It means gathering or congregation. But we translate it as church. And that's almost too bad because we get the idea that there were buildings. You all know from the children's song that the church is not a building. Amen? Who is the church? Who is the church? Very good. Very good. Today's church in the United States has been studied inside and out. I did this when I was becoming a pastor. I still look at some of those studies from time to time. And I love the definition of a small church. Definition of a small church has really not been defined very well because everybody has their own definition of a small church. I read a study recently that said, <clears throat> usually to define a small church is any church that has less than 250 members. Every church I've ever pastored, small church. They're small and they're small, right? So usually 250 is the cutoff point. Seven in 10 churches in the United States today have 100 or less in attendance each Sunday. Well, we might as well shut all those down, right? My wife and I have been attending a church. I'll never forget the first time we walked in. We walked in, it was immense. There were people milling all over the place. And there was a, there was a coffee cafe when on one side and there was upstairs where all the classrooms were and I looked into the sanctuary it was it was it, it I felt like it could have covered the entire grounds here I looked at my wife I said I feel like I went to the mall <laughs> great great music great pastor I love the preaching but it's not the same as Smith Chapel and I, I don't I don't mean to put it down because I still go there I love it but sometimes we think that's good because it's big. Well, it wasn't always that big. It started off like Smith Chapel. Seven out of 10 churches in the United States today have 100 or less people in attendance each Sunday. And yet, here's the interesting thing. Seven out of 10 churchgoers, which is us, seven out of 10 of us go to what we call a megachurch. So that means, that figures out that over half of all churches have an average attendance of less than 65. Are we going to shut them all down? I had a friend who was a pastor, and he had, he had three small churches. 
Western Pennsylvania. And one got so small, there was like four elderly ladies left and they couldn't even give enough money to, to keep to get the doors open anymore. So, so they had a meeting. They, they were going to shut the church down, but they had, had to have a meeting for that. The district superintendent came in and they, they put out uh, the information in the newspaper and on the radio, we're going to have this meeting. So when they had the meeting, the church was packed. <laughs> And all the people said, you can't shut down our church. So they said, okay, <laughs> would, you, would you like to come? <laughs> they ended up with a church of 40 people. I guess they're out there somewhere. And I guess they need to hear from us. Now, small churches have some advantages. Having been a small church pastor, I can tell you, there's a higher level of commitment per capita. There's a higher percentage of participation in weekly worship. Now, I go to this small church, <laughs> and I rarely see the same people twice. Higher level of giving. You say, well, we, we, we're kind of struggling. We don't have that much money here. But you give more per capita than they do in most other churches. Because you're small and you know this is God's work. There's a higher likeliness of individual volunteers in a small church. A higher percentage of mission giving. And probably just as important as anything else, the pastor of a small church has the ability and the possibility of knowing everyone. Doesn't happen where I go to church. My pastor doesn't know me from Adam. Probably, probably like to keep it that way. <laughs> oh man. What, when do you don't you have to leave pretty soon, Bill? Um, now, don't like, don't get me wrong. Large churches have advantages too. They have a greater willingness to change. <laughs> they have a clearer sense of mission and purpose because they're not worried about all this peripheral stuff that we have to be worried about in small churches. They have a greater, believe this or not, studies have shown they have a greater sense of spiritual vitality. Now, that, remember, this is just an average, average church. And they have more opportunities for each congregant. I, I can tell you, over the years, Smith Chapel has lost members because people have come and said, you know, Pastor, we love it here, but we need something more for our kids or we need something more for I knew I had one guy who said, we love this place, but we've got to leave. I said, why? He said, because, you know, I've got to make business connections and the church down the street has a lot more connections. I ran into him a few years later. I think he felt kind of bad that he did that. But, but every church, every congregation has its gifts and graces. And, and if it follows Christ, it's going to do what Jesus wants. It's going to get the things done that Jesus has given to this particular congregation or whatever particular congregation it is. Simple, simple matter is, wherever we are, we are called to do the one thing that nobody else in the world is called to do, and that is to continue to follow Christ. When you're called to Jesus, you're not called simply to come and sit in a pew. You've heard that many times. You're not called to simply say, yeah, I'm a Christian. It's not just fire insurance, as a lot of people like to say. I believe that small churches are the seedbed of Christianity. They were in the first century Rome, and I believe they are here today. If you go to China... Where do you find the churches? In people's homes. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Many, many lives, coming back to Smith Chapel, over 23 years, I saw this happen over and over and over again. Many lives were touched by this congregation and the worship here and the service that we perform. Some were only here for six months, a year, two years, and then they moved on, whether they moved away or decided a better, they would go to a church that maybe fit them better or whatever. We touched their lives. I'm not real keen on Facebook, but I have a page and I go and try to look at it once every couple of weeks. <laughs> it gets me in trouble sometimes. But I, 
But one day I went there and I saw a message from this gal. I didn't recognize the name. I didn't, but she said, is this, is this the Dave Zucchelli who used to pastor in Western Pennsylvania? And I shot back and said, yes, it is. She said, well, you probably don't remember me or knew me at the time. But when I was a little kid coming to one of your congregations, your words touched my heart. That was years ago. And I'll tell you something, I hang on to that. Because there have been many people come through this congregation. I've forgotten the faces. I've forgotten the names. Sometimes I'll I have a vague memory of one of them and think, I wonder whatever happened to that person. But I know something for sure. While they were here, we did our job and we touched their lives by the power of Christ. We changed their lives. I shouldn't say we did, but we did what God wanted us to do. And through his power, through his Holy Spirit, we touched their lives. Even though we'll never see them again until glory. That's what a small church can do. That's what any church can do. These people have gone and taken their faith to other peoples and other places. In Isaiah 60, verse 22, Isaiah is talking about Israel, but he, but, he says, but he says this, the least one, the least one shall become a clan and the smallest one, a mighty nation. I am the Lord in its time, I will hasten it. In other words, the Lord is saying, you might think you're small. You might think you don't have many talents. You might think there's not much to give here, but I want to tell you something. I will hasten the day when you will touch lives and create part of the kingdom through me. To me, that's exciting. I remember my DS telling me one time, he said, I, I remember a guy who got out of seminary and when he was going to be appointed to a church, they, they asked him his preferences. He said, I don't care where you put me. But wherever you put me, leave me there. And they stuck him out in some country podunk church. And he, he retired there. Had a great ministry. Because he just didn't care where he was. He was going to follow Jesus. And they were going to do things according to the way God had called them. So I would just tell you this morning, continue following Christ, continue to grow in your walk, continue to improve your ministry to other people, and continue to be bound together in this congregation by God's Holy Spirit. Because with God's Holy Spirit, you cannot go wrong, you cannot be defeated. The Bible is very clear. That when Jesus establishes the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. And you know, it's, it's interesting. A gate, sometimes we forget about this. We think of hell coming in on us. No, no. You know what a gate is for? I have a gate at my house. I have two gates into my backyard. That is not to let people in. That's to keep people out. A gate is a defensive measure. So when Jesus says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, he means the church is going to come pounding on hell's gates. And you will not defeat us, hell. You will not defeat us, Satan, because we are victorious in Jesus Christ. Well, I want to end with this portion of scripture. In Jude... There's only one chapter, so Jude 17 to 23 says this. This is what Jude writes to the church. Dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. Have you watched the news lately? Talking to us. These are the people who divide you. Oh boy. Who follow mere natural instincts. And do not have the spirit of God. But you dear friends. You. By building yourselves up. In your most holy faith. And praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love. As you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. To bring you to eternal life. 
And he ends this by saying, be merciful to those who doubt. Don't look down your nose at them. Don't scoff at them. Don't be their enemy. Love them. Be merciful to those who doubt and save others by snatching them from the fire. And to others, show mercy mixed with fear. I'm sure David was a little afraid when he picked up those pebbles and walked up to that giant of a man. I'm sure he was, he was wondering, what am I doing here? And he just had those five small pebbles. And it turned out only needed one. Didn't need the armor of Saul. He just needed the Holy Spirit of God. And he needed to be obedient. And as lousy, but David was a wretch. Did you know that? Read his story. He was a wretch. And yet God called him a man after my own heart because he followed God's Holy Spirit, fell sometimes, screwed up sometimes, sinned a lot. But still a man after God's own heart. He knew where his salvation was kept. And he followed that one as best he knew how. Today, we have a lot more knowledge about Jesus and the Holy Spirit than David ever had. We can do the same. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for loving us. We give you thanks for the, for the challenge of being your people in this day and age, which we believe is, well, if it's not the end times, it's sure getting close. We ask, Lord, that you would come back and take us home, but until you do, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to take others with us. And we'll give you thanks and praise for that in the blessed and holy name of Jesus Christ and the church said.